We are at the we're at the top of the hour. We're at six o'clock in Central Time. So uh, we've got a good a good group here. It's nice to see everybody again. Um, and today's presenter will be Ola, and uh, we're excited to hear from her. So. Um, well, uh, I, I will, uh, well, actually, we should also think about uh, presenters for next week. So I don't think we have anybody lined up yet, right, Colin? I didn't see anybody. No, but we still have a little bit. We have to go over reactive expressions really quick. So yeah. we'll do like 10, 10 minutes of that, and then we'll transition over to Ola. So. That's right. Yeah, sorry, I forgot about the, the finishing part for you. Yeah. Um, okay. And then at the end, we'll talk about uh, who can present for us next week. Sound good. All right. Go ahead, Colin. So, uh, Ola, I don't want to step on your feet if you had any introductory stuff, um, but I'll kind of do a quick icebreaker here. Uh, let me share my screen with everybody. So, screen two. Um, so, welcome to week three. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about chapter two, basic UI, which Ola will take over. Um, but let's just do a quick five minute icebreaker um, to get us rolling a little bit tonight. Uh, if you've been living under a rock, uh, you should know that the Olympics are going on right now. Um, so my question is for the group is what is your favorite Olympic event? Um, so I'll just open that up to the group. Does anybody want to share? I think I'm partial to hockey. That's a winter thing. That is a good point. I said summer. I didn't specify what Olympics. So, but if you are more of a winter Olympics person, uh, you definitely can use a winter sport. So I didn't think about that, but yeah, great. Hockey's a good one. What else? I can across, add in two cents. Yeah, Sorry, I, I was going to say, I, I, I came across a uh, trampoline the other day. I, just, I don't know if it was my favorite, but it was definitely intriguing. It was intriguing to watch uh, watch trampoline. I guess they go up 30 feet in the air. Like, um, I, I get, if I even just had to jump once from 30 feet up in the air into like a pool of water, that would be a lot for me. So, uh, you know, hand, hats off to those guys for, for doing 30 feet over and over and over again. I seem to have uh, caught soccer is one of my favorites, uh, uh, more of the world stage than the Olympics, but it was nice to, to see the uh, games going on. Um, for some reason, every time I'm at any place, it's always kayaking and, and canoeing or kayaking and uh, uh, what's the other one uh, called uh, the water sports. And then the third one, uh, I, I always, ironically, it's always fun to watch ping pong. I've never seen so focused attention in such a very short area of, of space that uh, the ball is fly, flying so fast. They have some crazy technique in, in Olympic ping pong. That's my Excellent. favorite. Excellent. Anybody else? Um, volleyball, I've been watching that and it's, it's pretty interesting. Excellent. Yeah, I've been watching, uh, <clears throat> I watched the 400 meter races, both the men and women's, and I thought that was pretty neat to watch. Um, but I probably would have to say my favorite was the three on three basketball. That is such a different like view of basketball. It's just, it's so much more action and it's, it's really fun to watch. So I was really appreciative that they brought that in. Anybody else? <clears throat> yeah, I think my favorite is the rowing because I did some rowing when I was younger. So I really enjoyed watching the races for that. Yeah, fitting eight people in a boat is just in one of those small, thin, narrow boats is just crazy to me. But it's it's interesting to watch. Anybody else? I think we got everybody. Okay, great. Well, um, we'll kind of we'll kind of move on for tonight. Um, we're gonna kind of just some quick housekeeping reminders. Most people have returned to this, so. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm not going to cover these most, I'm not going to cover these uh, point by point, but really the big one again is if we need to slow down and discuss, just let me know. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You're not going to hurt other people's, you know, other presenters feelings. So, um, you know, remember discussion is one way we all learn. So if we need to have a discussion about a specific topic, please jump in at any time. Uh, and then the other ones, you know, take some time to learn the theory, please attempt the chapter exercises. I'll kind of cover an exercise tonight. 
um, just briefly like overview it because I think it does a really good job of showing how reactive expressions can be used to reduce duplication. So um, with that, we're going to chapter. We're going to finish up chapter one. I'm going to take about ten minutes to kind of talk about reactive expressions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ola to kind of talk about basic UI elements, and then we'll be pretty much done for tonight. So to kind of discuss where we were at last time, uh, we were discussing, we were finishing up, we talked about the UI, we talked about the server, and then we started to kind of discuss reactive expressions. And when we talk about reactive expressions, one of the key components or one of the reasons why we need to use reactive expressions is because it helps us reduce code duplication or duplication in our code. And this is especially important for Shiny apps because Shiny apps become more cumbersome with more code. So if you have a lot of repetition in your code, especially within the server function, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have issues of maintaining that code base, especially if you have a very large application. And then the other thing is, is debugging. And so trying to debug an app that's thousands of lines of code with lots of duplication and lots of dependencies that are built from that duplication, it's going to be harder to manage. And so reactive expressions are one of those tools that we have to help us reduce that type of code duplication. The book discusses, um, the book discusses that normally when you're just writing like analysis code, there's two ways to reduce duplication. And that's one, you know, we, we capture our values and variables or we use functions. But in a shiny application environment, we're going to use reactive functions. And reactive functions or reactive variable, or excuse me, reactive expressions are, are kind of like a function, but they act differently. And the really the big difference is, is, is that a reactive function is only going to run once, but it's going to change any time that the inputs change. And once inputs change, the reactive function reruns and then outputs whatever output that it has, whether that be sent to the UI or something within the environment. So it's really kind of important to know that anytime you have a reactive expression, it's going to run once, cache that object, and then anytime the inputs are changed, it's going to change uh, what's, what's expressed in that reactive expression. And so here's just kind of a basic example from the book of how you actually use a reactive expression. In our case, what we're doing is we're grabbing a data set um, and we're, we're grabbing a data set based on some user input and it outputs this function as a date or it outputs this expression as a data set. <clears throat> now, anytime that we call this reactive expression in our server function, we need to make, make it like it's an actual function. So anytime we refer to our data set, in our case, because we either want to print the summary of that data or to print a table, we have to use an open and close parenthesis at the end because it's technically a, it's kind of like a function. It's not a function, but it is a function, but it acts differently like a function. So uh, the book, our, the review guide has some interesting kind of visual um, visualizations of how a reactive expression works. I'm not gonna, just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through each one of these. But I encourage you to kind of look at these and kind of review them because it does a pretty good job of visualizing what a reactive expression is and how to actually use them. So to kind of solidify this, I'm going to kind of share the example. I really thought that exercise four really kind of expressed this, um, the use of reactive expressions and how we can use reactive expressions to reduce duplication in our code. And so this is the exercise from the chapter where um, that it's not complete. So does anybody want to um, tell me how can we use a reactive expression in this exercise to reduce code duplication? Does anybody want to share with what their solution was? I think my approach was to put it between line 11 and 12 and put a reactive expression that defines a reactive product that is the, the result of input X times input Y. Yeah, exactly. And really the first thing that, you know, when I first addressed this, I was looking at it and I was like, okay, how could, you know, how can I use a reactive expression here? Well, I had to take a step back look at the server code and identifying it, what's being duplicated. 
And like Connor said, it's this product object. This thing is being duplicated three times. It's being duplicated here, it's being duplicated here, it's being duplicated here. And again, this is a small shiny app. It probably isn't gonna affect our performance. It's, it's, you can maintain it, this application. But again, if your application expands to thousands of lines of code and you're doing the same thing over and over again, it's gonna be very hard to maintain and it's gonna have a lot of dependencies. And so you got to make sure that um, you got to make sure that you can, you know, take out that duplication to improve our code base. And the way that Connor was mentioning is that we add a line and I'm just going to bring in the solution that I had. And I think this is what you were expressing, Connor, just if I'm not, you know, <laughs> let me know. But you can see right here, step one was to create a reactive expression where I developed input dollar sign X times input dollar sign Y, saved that as product. And from there on forward, I just called it as a reactive expression in output product, output product plus five, so on and so forth. And what's nice about this in addition to it is if I have to say I wanted to add a different type of transformation to this, maybe I wanted to do, you know, I don't know, times 10 or something like that. I only have to change that one time and it goes down the entire, pretty much the entire code base without having to go through and go, okay, change product here, change product here, change product here. I only have to change it once. So um, yeah, go ahead. Does uh, Ryan, you got a question? Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting. I apologize. What I was curious about in the first example on the left is that we were just calling product, product plus five, product plus 10. In your uh, code example on the right, uh, the solution that you had provided, uh, you're putting parentheses on the end of product. Is there a reason for that? And I'm, I'm, I may be missing something really simple and I, I'm naive for asking, but that would, it, is a, would it work the same without the without the parentheses? That is a good question. Um, I'm not sure why you have to put them there. I'm guessing it's because okay. it's it's like a it's it's like a function, but it behaves differently than a function. But I mean, what Correct. we could do, but we could what we could do is we can experiment with it and see what happens. My guess right. is it's going to be error out, and and we get to see the error and see what happens. Yeah. So so, so Ryan, um, this is a mistake I made Go ahead, Connor. a couple of times. When I was making my, my first real, real app, um, that that reactive expression you're assigning it to. What's the name of the? It's product, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Line thirteen. Mm -hmm. That's not assigning a variable in the global environment. It's creating a function. I see. That returns okay. the multiplication of input that's... x and input y. So it's it's, it's creating a function okay. that returns okay. data. Yep. That makes sense. Thank you, Connor. That's that's a perfect example. Yeah, excellent question. And again, a lot of the time, what you're gonna figure out is is well, for me, anyways, like you know, I'll ask that question and I'll be like, well, what just happens if I do take a parenthesis away? Look at the error, see what it is, and see if you can kind of you know explain what the error means and go from there. Um, but I do appreciate you jumping in there, Connor. It yeah. really helps kind of clarify that. And wait till your inputs become reactives <laughs> that gets really complicated <laughs> that threw me for a loop to put those i had something almost working i mean a really complicated system and all i was missing were those prints um and then finally figured it out and lo and behold it's there so always be mindful of those uh, prints on reactive values my strategy is to append my, my my reactive variables with underscore reactive. So I know if I see underscore reactive at the end, I need to put parentheses. Because I, I forget that every time. So something like this, like reactive. Yep. And then you know that if it's called right here, reactive, you know you have, okay, that's, that's neat. Yeah, that's a good way to kind of think about it. I mean, I've seen other people do some stuff like, if you want to simplify this, I've seen people do this, especially in like Python, they'll do it like that. They'll put like an underscore or like a dot right there, but I don't know how that's going to affect the environment. But again, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's great. I like that. I might have to use, I'm going to take that from you. <laughs> Good. That, Is it, oh, go ahead. Can, can that reactive function say in line 13 also take arguments the way that a function can? So we, typically when we write functions, it's like function open parentheses, um, you know, argument one, argument two, would, could the reactive also take arguments like a function? Uh, 
Oh, I see what you're saying. So like you'd have something like data, like here, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, data or, and then, you know, gender, whatever, whatever arguments you want to add in. I mean, I almost wonder if you don't because you're actually the inputs, what, what turns out to be the arguments are there on line 14, input X, input Y, but I don't know, maybe there's another, another argument that goes into it. I don't know. I think the only argument is, is like I'm looking at the help now, like the only argument is an expression, which is the code that, that creates an output. I think you, I think you can reference like other variables in the environment or other reactives themselves. But I don't think it has any other arguments like a typical function would. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it, it's like a function, but like you can, like, I guess what, like, if I'm clarifying Connor, it's like you can refer to other environment variables in here without having to like set it in your arguments, right? Is that what you're saying? I, yeah, I think so. Like if you had other, like I, it gets, it's weird because the environment gets real funny in Shiny. Um, but I think you can reference other variables that Shiny knows about. But yeah, like no, a, oh, go ahead. I don't think there's arguments like there are in, in like the function mean or something. Mm -hmm. So like a system, like a system variable or something. If you had like a yeah. system variable, you could call it in like, I don't know, like a database connection. Like you could mm -hmm. call it a database connection object like that. Okay. That or, or, or if you read it in like a CSV and assign it to a variable in like mm -hmm. line 12, then you could probably reference that within reactive. But that wouldn't be an argument that's just part of the expression. Yeah, because at, at the application runtime, it's going to bring this, it's going to run this first to bring in the data, bring it into the environment. And so then you could call it, I don't know, you can mm -hmm. put data in here. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Can you, can you combine two reactive expressions together? Is that what you guys were talking about before? Like, um, let's say if I have an have a output that is, you know, not reactive, but it uses two different reactive expressions. Is that possible? Yep. Yeah, I, I don't know. So uh, maybe yeah. Connor can expand on that a little bit more. Or right, if you have reactive object A, which is react, which is like twelve, and reactive object B, which is twenty with a numeric input, you can have creative object C, which is the addition of those two. So it's just, you know, depends on how precursive and crazy you want to get. <laughs> and, may, and maybe when we get to more reactivity, it will make a little bit, you know, maybe we can talk more about that, um, but excellent, that's great. So does anybody have any other input from this example? I thought this one was great. I think it just clearly showed like, you know, the benefits of a reactive expression. I think, you know, in, in a simple example, and I'm sure it's going to get more complex than this, but, um, but excellent. Great conversation. Thanks for the input, everybody. Uh, so you can look through these visualizations. The other thing that's nice is if you want to see this in action, what you can do is you can run this in, uh, you can run this command, this run app, and change this argument to display.mode equals showcase. Um, and I have it, I have it running somewhere here. So just bear with me here for a second if I don't. But basically what happened, oh, it's right here. It's in my browser, duh. Um, if you wanted to, if you run that run app, what's nice about it is you can see how the reactive expressions actually work. And in our case, we have this reactive here. And so if I change my input, what you'll see is the, all the things that get affected. And so the showcase mode is kind of nice to kind of debug if you're kind of figure out what are the dependencies and stuff. And so you can kind of see, okay, what's being changed. Um, again, I put this in the, I put this out in the notes if you want to kind of play around with this more, but it's just run app the string to where your file is located, where your app file is and display that mode equals showcase. Well, and Colin, that's a great Great uh, input. What I was what I was curious about in this reactive thought process is is what is Shiny doing in compiling to the to the HTML JavaScript uh, CSS? Like what what are we actually 
working on. And, and this is a great visibility to uh, see uh, as you're interacting with your app, the calls that are being made in the, in the uh, text or in the script. Yep. And there's, and there's also another tool that will show the dependencies of it. I haven't used it much. We'll get to it like as we get to more advanced features, but there will be, there's another tool that Shiny has that allows you to see all the dependencies and how they, how they work together. But again, this is just a nice little debugging tool if you're kind of interesting on like what affects what. So cool. Uh, so those are the visualizations. Here's some resources. I'm not going to, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over them. Um, you can look at them on your own, but there's a nice cheat sheet available, just like anything that's pretty much built in the tidyverse. There's a cheat sheet for it. I tried to link it, but it doesn't really work very well. So um, you can just access it by clicking this link here. And that's pretty much it. That's chapter one. So any questions? Okay, cool. I kind of went over my 10 minutes, so I better shift over to Ola here. So Ola, if you want to um, jump in, you have the floor. Thanks, Colin. Um, my presentation is going to be super short. Um, My computer is rendering a little bit slow. Sorry about that. Um, well, I guess I can talk uh, while my computer renders. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yep. Yeah, so the second chapter is all about um, the UI, the user interface. It's also known as the front end. And the, the front end um, deals with whatever the user, whatever the data that the user inputs and whatever, um, and after the user inputs the data or interacts with your app, um, it also, renders um, an output. Um, the three main outputs um, in this chapter are text, table, and plots. Uh, and I, the best way I can explain this is just to show you through, through an app. Um, I'm going a little bit off the script, but these are like apps that I played around with. So right here, um, it's a basic shiny app. Uh, we have our UI, uh, our flu page, and then we have our server. And we called in um, the shiny app and put in our UI in our, in our server. So uh, the text input um, is the text input it, um, is a text box. Um, most of uh, functions that are um, input functions have, it's, it has a ID and then the label. So in this case, our ID is name and our label is enter name. And the way that we're going to render this text is with the text output um, function. And the text output uh, functions are always paired with uh, server fu function called, um, they're usually called render functions. So this text output function is paired with the render text function. Um, and the idea of this is Q. Uh, it usually follows output, then the dollar sign, and then whatever uh, we want to name this output which is Q. And so I'm just going to run the app. And um, enter name. I'm going to choose PGD. And uh, you can see that my display is displaying um, what I put in the text text box. Uh, are there any questions? Any 
hang ups or anything. Okay. All right. And then I'm going to go into another app that I was playing around with. Um, it's exploring um, baby names. Um, so like the, uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the baby names data set? Mm -hmm. All right, I get nods and thumbs up. So <laughs> that's very comforting. Uh, and so this is, so I can go over the UI. Um, right here we have an, our input um, function, text input. Uh, it's a text box and the ID of this is called named input. The label is entry name. And I just put in like a default um, name. Um, so the graph would automatically render a David. And then this is our, um, our UI, um, our output um, UI function plot output. And so, like I was saying before in the hello input, we were um, rendering text. So it's text output. And then here it's plot out output. And we're gonna you know, display a plot. And this plot output is paired with a server uh, function called render plot, which is right here. And so our output is trend. And you can see that it's connected, like the back end is connected here, or call it trend. And then inside, I'm just creating a plot. Um, so yeah, I'm subsetting the baby names based on whatever the user puts inside of the, of the text box. Uh, so I'm just gonna run this app. Uh, it has David. And then that is the trend um, for David through the years 1880 through 2000 and something. Um, I don't know any suggestions for names that I can put in here. I just, I just think it's interesting that it looks like David is a non zero for females at some point at occasional points throughout history. Oh. It seemed like a straight zero line, but that's good. Um, you should see um, Francis, I think. Yeah, I thought that it was interesting that it could be gender neutral. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And uh, this trend, it goes with other uh, inputs as well. So um, here I'm still exploring the, the baby names uh, data set. And I have two inputs, select input, uh, slider input. And the first entry is the ID, then the label. And then, you know, like the other parameters are going to vary based on what type of input um, you are going to use. Um, the book has um, several examples of that. So in the select input, you have multiple check boxes that you can define. And then the slider input, um, you can define how big are the ranges your sliders are going to be. And then I have a plot output um, function that's gonna display a plot and it's paired with the render plot um, function in the back end. So I hope this works. I haven't played around with this.
and works. And so, um, yeah, this displays the top 10 names based off of gender and year. Um, so this is the top names in 1900s. Uh, let's see what is the top name in 2010. Um, yeah, and then I can change. I want, want it to be male names. So um, that is all from my presentation. Um, is there anything else that you found interested in, interesting about the chapter two? So I do have one question. Um, so seeing on your slider here, because we're trying to represent years, and this is this was outside of the book, but and I'm wondering if there's some type of option available to get rid of the comma. Probably. Anyway, I don't um, know if I I don't know if, if if anybody has input or Olaf, you know the answer to that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that you can get rid of the comma. I'm a little bit afraid of Googling because my computer is it's slow. So if someone can Google the answer. I think there is an option for that. I've done that in the past. There's a format argument, I think. Yeah, I've used format and like, you know, data visualizations and stuff like that. So I didn't know if that's like for the, the slider input, if that was the default format. So I wonder, I can actually do some digging here, but that's my question, so. Uh, and I have, a, I have another question, maybe you also don't have the answer, is if uh, we like something, is there a way to, um, to download the, the chart, something like that, you know, just to, to, keep, uh, to keep a copy of something? Uh, so, are you, so are you asking me, is there a way to, Keep a copy of yes, just to save uh, to save the to save the chart when we are looking, for example, at David. If you uh, with the birth rate, if we like something, yes, I was wondering if there is a way to save. Are you talking about like an like an export function, yeah. like export the visualization or something? Yeah, it just, you know, it's just a, it's just a question, but uh, because yeah. No, I, I think I may have an answer for you. So I, I'm, this may not be R related, but from the standpoint of an HTML server, there is going to be a resource folder. Inside the resource folder is probably an image directory, maybe named something different. Pictures is another term that some people use, uh, media. Uh, nine times out of 10, that image may be in there. What is going to be tricky though, is the fact that it may be a vector graphic because you're you're constantly manipulating the data, mm -hmm. so um, if if you were to do a, a plot like the the comment about exporting or, or the visualization, that's going to obviously give you a selection of JPEG, PNG, vector, etc. In a web framework, the fact that it's reactive, it may be more vector oriented. Um, I could probably dig into that a bit and maybe get a better answer for you, but um, that's a very web servery kind of answer or, or a front end type answer. I well, I'll go ahead. Connor. To, sorry, if you're just trying to do, if you're trying to save a plot that's in Chinese, pretty sure there's there's built-in functionality for that. Um, I, I've I've added the export functions for tables in my, in my apps. I don't know, I haven't done it for for graphs, but I'm sure there's a built-in option for that. Yeah, I was going to say that too, you know, I mean, because there's, 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 there's the ability to do like a download button, but like if you use a different package called Plotly, which I think you brought in with this application here, um, Plotly, I think has, because it's, it's a, it's a, it's a widget that you can use, like an online based widget <clears throat> that does data visualization. I think part of that, it has options for you to like click the button to export like a PNG or a JPEG or something, but don't quote me on that. It's been a long time since I've used Plotly. Yeah, it has a download PNG. And um, I know with the uh, shiny apps, you know, you can embed like your outputs. I'm pretty sure you can embed it into like a markdown, an R markdown file or into like a web page as well, if you want to like share your work with um, people um, outside of work.
that, that's a good that's a good point because i was thinking about that because it said something about like download like you know download and i was thinking well could you output a pdf report like this like if you wanted to include something you know say if you were creating an app for you know your organization or something and somebody wanted that report you could just automatically do an r markdown and so yeah it's, it's great people <laughs> use the reports more than the app i think <laughs> jump on the app and then hit the button run it and then then use it yeah i could see that that's cool I, if 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 you have an example of that that would be great to see because i think that would be useful yeah i'd like to see it too so if i guess so we're talking if you embed the shiny app inside of an r markdown and then you do like we were just seeing here uh put in in place certain settings you put the name and you pick the year then you can knit to a pdf with those particular settings in the output is that what we're saying yeah you can download a report it's it's it gets to it in the chapter that's where i learned how to do it from this book um so it's pretty easy i i don't have any public facing uh apps that can do it but it's it's once you dig into it and get more experience, it's pretty easy. You could download that report, make that report and get a nice, uh, either PDF can be a little tricky, um, depending on it's, if you're doing it from shiny IO, you can do it. Um, page down, it can be a little tricky, uh, but you can do a regular PDF. I do a regular PDF or, or app. Sorry. I go to HTML is actually a little bit easier to, to download but it's an option Be yeah cool. i think just 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 to ryan's point i think exporting a report from shiny is pretty straightforward if you like when, once you know the approach um but embedding a shiny app inside a markdown document is um a whole nother thing and you can't like you can only you can share it with other people but they have to have Shiny installed on their machine as well. It's not like you can just email them that, that markdown document and it'll run regardless of what, of what their machine is. And that's why you have to run like a Shiny server or put it on shinyapps.io if you want to share it that way. Ola, during your presentation or, or during your research for the, for the presentation, it, it, did you run into any school of thought in separating your ui.r file versus your uh, server r file uh, so so in shiny if you if you have them as two separate entities and and have them open at the same time and hit run it'll still activate the same way i know colin's example and your example in this presentation has been in one single file and then you call on it the, the last line of text shiny app ui equals ui um, have you ever tried to, to separate the two files? Is there any school of thought that the team would, would uh, offer in that regard? So I did not know that you could do that uh, with Shiny apps. Um, just based off the, the book that we're reading. And then I took like a, I tried to take a data camp course about it and they just grouped it all together. But like keeping the, UI and the server separate. I think that's more of a like a software development type of um, work. That's what I was, yeah, that's what I was thinking too. I, I so before the cohort and, and the book club and, and et cetera, um, playing around with Shiny, uh, I developed a, a I used a package called TimeViz, and uh, I'll send it in the chat here if you want to check it out. It's kind of really cool, especially if you're wanting just really simple calendar type uh, uh, interactivity of, of being able to display resources. Um, it's not a Gantt chart. You're, you're not creating a timeline or anything in that regard. So uh, uh, there's a little bit of, of uh, confusion there, but um, TimeViz um, was my first Shiny app. And where I'm going, the instructions from that developer was having it in two separate files. Um, in researching our studio and, and, and some of the forum posts in the community, um, it's a it's a mixed bag. Sometimes you'll see it as one file, other times you'll see it as two files. And I'm I'm only curious if anybody has ran into that same text. Uh, I didn't see it directly called out in the book, uh, or if if the uh, 
author had made any distinction. Yeah. I think it's a matter of, of preference. Um, like my approach is if I have to start scrolling my script to see more, then I separate them. Especially when I've got like, my one app is like 400 lines like combined. Yep. And that's just too hard to like, just keep track of all, all in one script. Well, and the, the, the thought that I was having in the relation of why you would have them in two different files would be like front end, back end. So Ola, you had referenced it at the very beginning of the presentation with the, the front end, back end handshake. So if I'm working on my front end, you know, user viewing, I would have it in one file. And if I want to mess with the server code on the other side, you know, you would add some more content, but good, good thought. And there's, I'm glad everyone else has, has had that same curiosity. Yeah. I think there's also, um, I use Golem because my apps get really large, thousands of lines. And so that separates everything out, but your UI and server are on use modules. So you're just like, I usually go a page is a different module and we'll get into that, but I can see this. I have to see the server and the UI to match them up. <laughs> Because when you get a lot, cause then you just forget, and then you're going to another file. So I like having it on one, but you know, as people were saying, as it gets more complex. But if you had a huge app, I mean, it can get thousands. I had one that went when I didn't know any better, got to two thousand lines. I was going crazy. So be mindful. So what do you mean by a different module, though? Um. Use, that, it's an app within an app so you call it gets complicated um but you're doing let's say i have like my opening screen my front my front page will be an app that could run by itself but mm -hmm. it all kind of works together it, it's I, part of the piece of the puzzle I, and all yeah. of these different components come together to work um but that makes sense. I thought you were talking about some functionality within the IDE, but you're that's the that's the, the actual app itself. I got it. You're putting a bunch of scripts that all work together. What and and would you would you consider that same statement as kind of like the book down library of being able to compile all your markdowns into one large document? Would that be a similar trait that, yeah, that I, Ryan may I, compare to? I think that's a good uh, comparison. It's just, yeah. um, you're putting it, yeah, because it, it really, as your apps get more complicated, it's really nice to have work on one section and, um, and then you just call other parts of the app to work together. So yeah, that's a good, um, I would say that's a good comparison. Yeah. Uh, um just in general, like the whole shiny ecosystem just reminds me of web development, like your UI is like the HTML, CSS, and then the server is the JavaScript that um, works, you know, that deals with the behavior of the app. So I, I think you're like touching upon those things, Ryan, so. Like, are you good, like a, like a Python Ruby type backend sort of, of application is that the the comment the front and back end relationship or yeah. yeah i uh i i i was i was surprised when reading the text and everything was in one single file call and when you started our our cohort um the the first example was that that uh the uh, one single file and i thought huh i i didn't realize you could do that um that's kind of a neat way of, of changing it um yeah, that that was all I was going to add on. No, and I mean, I, I I mean, I wouldn't say that I've built a lot of shiny apps, but I've I've ran into those positions before where it's like, okay, I'm going to develop an app, so I do one file, and then you're just like, okay, I have to manage this, so then it's like, okay, I'm going to split it UI and server, and then it gets even more complicated. And I got to the point where, you know, I tried to use Gollum, I just wasn't sophisticated enough in my shiny development to really take on Gollum. Um, and I probably couldn't even do justice what it can actually do. But when I got to modules, 
that's when it got a little bit more complicated because I didn't have that developer mindset of how do you split up a project? And so, you know, it, it, I guess it depends on the purpose of your app and how much you want to manage and how big you and how big it's going to get. So that's just my perspective though, but that's a, that's an analyst perspective, not a web developer, software developers perspective. So. So what, one thing that stuck out to me in the, in the chapter, um, and um, I don't, I, this is in case anybody is still trying to make sense of all this like I am, but it sounds like from the conversation, a lot of people have this understood, but I liked the sentence in the chapter um, that said, uh, is it? says it's in 2.3 and it says outputs in the UI create placeholders that are later filled by the server function. <laughs> so that helped me to think about the connection between the two so that it's so like into the UI, you have inputs and you have outputs as well. And then the connection to the outputs is what's in the server. So the parts from the server function fill in the output the the placeholder that, that you create with the output in the UI gets filled by an output from the server part. Anyway, in my novice level, that was a, an aha moment for me, so I thought I'd mention it. And and, a, and oh, go go ahead, Ryan. No, forgive me. I I was only going to add that uh, that that kind of actually is is like uh, almost web development 101, right? It, but that not to, not to uh, uh, make anybody feel uh, aware of it. So when you're building your web page, right, you, you're, you're adding all of this extra flavor of HTML and this tagging, you know, to, to, to put these placeholders there. One of, the, one of my favorite, favorite uh, storylines uh, that I think has been resolved, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in old school HTML, if you wanted a two column page, you actually create a table and then fill all of your other content in the table so that on the screen, it would appear as a, a column or form, but it's not really a column. It's actually the, the, the document object model is you're forcing it to, to split uh, uh, panes between the uh, web page. Uh, I, I believe that's been resolved in the new tags with tables. I think it has anyway, uh, HTML5, but um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the placeholder concept of, of building the web page, you're, you're sketching it out, you know, kind of where do you want to put your stuff? And maybe that's a good way of, of thinking of the shiny app of, of, you know, I want this slider here, I want that, uh, you know, output graph there, uh, maybe the table I'll put on another screen. Um, maybe that's a good way of, of rendering it. I, I'm, the first thing that came to mind when you said that, Ryan, was div tags. Uh, uh, being being able to, to encapsulate your your little chunk in this one uh, arena uh, area of your screen, and and know that it'll render on a tablet, a, a, a phone, a, a web page, etc. Yeah, good. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other thoughts or anything you came across? Something that you learned during the this chapter? or something that you already knew that relates? I just, I wanna add like one more thing. Um, I think it's just amazing to kind of see that you can put together a pretty sophisticated-ish app with very few lines of code. I mean, I think that's something that's important to kind of know. And, you know, especially, you know, something like, like myself, I'm, I'm an analyst, I'm not a software developer but I have the tools where I could quickly write a few functions, a few, a few, you know, inputs, outputs, and I have a useful app that I could create and host on shinyapp.io. And so, you know, it kind of abstracts away at a high level. I don't necessarily need to know how to write HTML. I don't necessarily have to know how to write backend code to create an application. And so I, I, I just kind of emphasize that, that it's well worth even just learning some of these like, um, available functions because you can make useful apps really, really quick. But that's my two cents. Agreed, agree, 100% with Colin. Until, until you get those 
thousand, 2000 line monsters. And then it's like, okay, now I, now I need to become a better developer than I am an analyst. So that's why I'm kind of doing this book club so I can get a little bit better at that. The, uh, the, uh, I, if you don't mind adding, or I, I add a uh, statement, um, the reason I started looking at shiny as a service, uh, the Microsoft outlook, uh, we were scheduling a lot of resources and I found it was, I don't know, 30 clicks just to schedule an event and apply resources and then track it and everything else. And that's, you know, crossing your fingers that the, the, the uh, exchange server updates and everyone gets their notifications. So um, I went and said, okay, we're done with this. I'm just going to create this single web page of, I'm going to put a CSV file together because I just need, you know, end and uh, start and end dates with, with resources. What I, during the research of that uh, uh, project, uh, there was a, if you go to the shiny web page uh, uh i think it's shiny io they have uh code examples and there was a developer or person that put together uh tracking their pets medications and you can obviously view or download their their source to kind of view what they were doing and, and this thing was it looked rather complex but when you open the, the shiny code and you were looking at it well like, that, that that makes sense I, I i see how that's being put together and uh trying to draw from that those examples um, there was one section in there where they were linking to, I think, their Google Calendar and like sending themselves notifications of, of you know, entry to make sure that their pet gets to the vet on time. And I thought, wow, that's that really kind of started to blow my mind of just scheduling, I guess. I was I was kind of in a scheduling mindset when I was looking at the, the service. But I, I, I would share the link with somebody or I would share the link with the team just to, to go check out the code. But um, I, I know that web page gets refreshed quite often, um, the uh, examples that you get to publish up there. So I doubt I'd be able to find it again. Anyone else? We're getting close to, to our time here. So probably one thing that we should do is make sure that we have somebody ready to present for next week. So anybody on the call now that would be interested in handling chapter three, right? We're up to chapter three, basic reactivity. I'm looking at it on my other screen here. Yeah. August 11th, basic reactivity. I think I could do that. Excellent. Thank you, Connor. Um, and then I'll have it for the following week, uh, although it's not showing. It's not showing on the. Um, I don't think it's showing on the GitHub yet, but. I'll it should be. That. It should yeah. be. They pulled in. They pulled in my pull request, oh, yeah. so it should be, yeah, there in there is. now. Okay. Um, that that reminds me of a quick thing. Um, so if you are going to make additions to those materials, which I highly suggest you do, I talked with John. John Harmon, I think is his last name, who manages these book clubs in the back end of it. Um, if you are going to change those materials, fork directly from the R for DS one. Don't fork from mine and then make changes. Fork directly from that one and then make changes and then make a pull request to that main repo because they're the ones who approve all the changes. Um, I don't approve them. So, um, yeah. And basic things like changing the schedule and stuff, just do the same thing, pull request and, and go from there. So. And if anybody needs any help, let me know. I'm more than happy to jump in and show you how to do it. Very good. All right. I think we're all set then. Appreciate everybody joining. We'll pick it up again next week. And otherwise, you know, check in with the Slack every once in a while and we'll stay in touch there. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Ola. And thanks everybody for your, for your time and contributions. We will see you next time. Sounds good. See you. Bye. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.